taught that the heavens were harmonious and changeless. And Ptolemy had said that the motions of the planets through the stars of the zodiac were portents of events here below. Was it the influence of Mars and Venus that made his father a brutal man, a mercenary who had abandoned him? Did an unfortunate conjunction of planets in an adverse sign make his mother a mischievous and quarrelsome woman? If such things were fated by the stars, then perhaps there were hidden patterns underlying the unpredictable chaos of daily life. Patterns as constant as the stars. But how could you discover them? Where would you begin? If the world and everything in it was crafted by God, then shouldn't you begin with a careful study of physical reality? Was not all of creation an expression of the harmonies in the mind of God? The Book of Nature had waited 1,500 years for a reader. In 1589, Kepler left Malbronn to continue his studies at the great university in Tübingen. It was a liberation to find himself amidst the most vital intellectual currents of the time. One of his teachers revealed to him the revolutionary ideas of Copernicus. Kepler relished this urbane, scholarly community. Here, his genius was recognized at last. Kepler was not to be ordained after Tübingen. Instead, to his great surprise, he found himself summoned to Graz in Austria to become a teacher of high school mathematics. Kepler was not a very good teacher. The first year in Graz's mathematics class had only a handful of students. The second year, none. He mumbled, he digressed. He was at times utterly incomprehensible. He was distracted by an incessant clamor of speculations and associations that ran through his head. And one pleasant summer afternoon, with his students longing for the end of the lecture, he was visited by a revelation that was to alter radically the future course of astronomy and the world. There were only six planets known in his time, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. For some time, Kepler had been wondering, why only six planets? Why not 20 planets or 100? And why this particular spacing between their orbits? No one had ever asked such questions before. In the course of a lecture on astrology, Kepler inscribed within the circle of the zodiac a triangle with three equal sides. He then noticed, quite by accident, that a smaller circle inscribed within the triangle bore the same relationship to the outer circle as did the orbit of Jupiter to the orbit of Saturn. Could a similar geometry relate the orbits of the other planets? Now Kepler remembered the perfect solids of Pythagoras. Of all the possible three-dimensional shapes, there were five, and only five, whose sides were regular polygon. He believed that the two numbers were connected, that the reason there were only six planets was that there were only five regular solids, in these perfect solids, nested one within the other, he believed he had discovered the invisible supports for the spheres of the six planets.
And this connection between geometry and astronomy could, he thought, admit only one explanation, the hand of God mathematician. The intense pleasure I received from this discovery can never be told in words, he said. Now I no longer became weary at work. Days and nights I passed in mathematical labors until I could see whether my hypothesis would agree with the orbits of Copernicus or if my joy would vanish into thin air. But no matter how hard he tried, the perfect solids and the planetary orbits did not agree with each other very well. Why didn't it work? Because unfortunately, it was wrong. The true orbital sizes of the planets, we now know, have absolutely nothing to do with the five perfect solids, as the later discovery of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto shows. But Kepler spent the rest of his life pursuing this geometrical phantasm. He couldn't abandon it, and he couldn't make it work. His frustration must have been enormous. Finally, he decided that it must be the long-accepted planetary observations that were inaccurate, and not his model of the nested solids. There was only one man in the world who had access to more precise observations. That man was Tycho Brahe, who, as chance would have it, had recently written Kepler to come and join him. Kepler was reluctant at first, but he had no choice. In 1598, a wave of oppression enveloped Kratz. It was spearheaded by the local archduke, who vowed to restore the Catholic faith to the province, and, in his own words, would rather make a desert of the country than rule over heretics. Kepler's school was closed, people were forbidden to worship or to sing hymns or to own books of a heretical nature. Those who refused to embrace Catholicism were fined 10% of their assets and exiled from the country on pain of death. Kepler chose exile. Hypocrisy, I have never learned. I am in earnest about faith. I do not play with it. For Kepler, it was only the first in a series of exiles forced upon him by religious fanatics. Now he decided to accept Tycho Brahe's open invitation. Brahe, a wealthy Danish nobleman, lived in great splendor and had recently been appointed imperial mathematician at Prague. Kepler left Graz with his wife and stepdaughter and set out on a difficult journey. Kepler's wife was not a happy woman. She was chronically ill and had recently lost two young children. The marriage itself was no comfort. She had no understanding of her husband's work and regarded his profession with contempt. Kepler was married to his work, and every tedious mile was bringing him closer to the great Tycho Brahe, whose observations, he devoutly hoped, would confirm his theory. Kepler envisioned Tycho's domain as a sanctuary from the evils of the time.